Awesome. Well, it's such a privilege to be here. I just want to honor Pastor Paul, Pastor Denise. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you guys. I was telling your wife, I was uh, last year at the prophetic conference, and I knew that the Lord was depositing something in my life, but I just didn't know the depth uh, or the gravity of it until I got home. And I just felt like, man, I'm walking on a new level of faith, walking on a new level of belief. And uh, the last six months has been a testimony of radical, exponential financial miracles for our ministry. And uh, God did something in my life last time I was in Vegas. And so I want to honor you guys as trailblazers. You know, trailblazing sounds really sexy as a title, but the reality is uh, that you're the one getting hit by all the branches. You're the one clearing the brush. You're walking through it. And I just feel like people like you and your wife uh, have gone through it. So the journey for people in my generation is a little easier. So I honor you guys and just thank you guys for being fathers and mothers of the faith. Man, we love what God is doing in Vegas. Everybody calls it Sin City, but I know that God has a plan and a purpose for this place. When Doug first moved here, I was grieved in my spirit because I was losing a friend, a partner. Uh, but he told me, he said, Russell, I know Las Vegas is going to experience revival. And I said, why? He said, because nothing is weird in Vegas. And it's true. Uh, if you ever walked the strip, been outside, you know nothing is weird in Vegas. And so uh, people are hungry for something that's authentic and something that is real. I'll give you a little insight about my ministry. I want to share with you tonight out of John 4, talk about the woman at the well. Uh, but before I do, I'll give you a little background on who I am, where I came from. I'm 29. I used to work in government. I was a lobbyist for for a while and then worked for the House of Representatives uh, in the state capital of Washington State and uh, graduated Bible college, raised in a ministry home, somehow got involved in politics and did that for a few years and uh, God by His grace provided uh, an open door uh, for me out of the political world and, and uh, was brought on by a large Assemblies of God church in our region, worked there for a few years and then about 10 months ago, the Lord laid on my heart to plant, and so that's exactly what we did. Uh, and uh, Pastor Denise was mentioning barns as she received the tithe and the offering uh, tonight. We planted our church in a literal barn, not a figurative barn, but a real barn without a back wall, without heat, uh, without indoor bathrooms, nothing. We had outhouses uh, surrounded by a bunch of hay, and we planted in a barn with 250 radical, hungry young people who are crying out for revival in their day and reformation in our lifetime. And that's what God has brought branded on our hearts. It's a message to be passionate. We refuse to walk when God is said to run, and we are believing that we are living and walking on the precipice of the next great awakening in our region. We believe in hope for America. We believe in hope for the world. We don't buy into victimhood Christianity. We are not victims of the culture. We are more than victors, more than conquerors, because we're in Christ, and God's in a good mood, and he's up to some good things. I got called by the lead political reporter of our hometown newspaper when I landed in Vegas. He said, Pastor Russell, I'd like a quote from you about the recent Supreme Court ruling. And uh, his name is Jerry. I said, Jerry, listen, uh, as believers, we're responsible not to the Supreme Court, but to the Supreme Being. And God is doing something in our region. And so we're excited. We're just excited. Come on, we refuse to live passionless Christianity. I think it was Beethoven who said, to play a wrong note is unavoidable, but to play without passion is inexcusable. And so we run. Uh, we're hungry. Uh, we believe uh, that God uh, has, uh, has a lot of good things uh, ahead of us. The best days are ahead of us. In fact, as I was praying for ICLV and thinking about the ministry here, I felt like the Lord laid uh, on my heart uh, uh, for, for the senior leadership team uh, the story of Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine. And, and uh, you, you all are familiar with the story. He turns water into wine and presents it to the master of the ceremonies. The master of the ceremonies says usually they bring out the best wine at first. After everybody's plastered, they bring out the bad stuff because nobody can tell the difference. But you've saved the best for last. And I just feel like God is saying this over this church, over your influence, over this ministry, that God has saved the best for last. And so I, I, just, I just feel like the next 10 years of ministry, uh, you're going to see more miracles, more salvations, greater resources than the last 20 plus years combined. And so, uh, man, I just feel like, I feel like the word for this house is, is, is victorious Christian living. And so we're excited for you guys. Uh, and, and even though we're not officially a part of the same denomination, we feel partnered in the spirit uh, with this church. So we're excited for you guys. We're praying for you. We believe in what God is doing at ICLV and, and the campuses around this region. And uh, we're just excited. We, uh, uh, our ministry started with me uh, and my wife and, and, and two young people. We met in a cafe. And how many of you know when you have four people in your church, one of whom is your wife, uh, you begin every service by saying, where two or three are gathered, God is here. You know, you're, you're quoting that. You're reminding yourself. 
Come on, God, I think you're here. I hope you're here. Uh, but we begin to pray and fast because that's literally the only thing that we knew how to do. I tell our young people all the time that, that my primary investment that I give you uh, is not a theological. It's not intellectual. It's a heart that refuses to do anything but burn white heart for a relationship with Jesus. And so we model the very thing that we want others to follow. And you know what I've learned about leadership is that what I do in moderation, people who follow me do in excess. And so if I'll burn with passion, if I'll commit commit myself to be unwavering and unmoved in my dedication to search his heart, then those who come after me will go further than me because of the example that I set. You know what we owe the older generation? We owe them the honor of running further than them. We owe mo mothers and fathers of the faith the honor of running further than them. The way that we honor fathers and mothers is not just by giving shout outs. It's not just by an honorarium. It's not just by an honorable mention on a website. It's to say, I'm going to take everything that you've invested in me with a God-given mandate to make your floor my ceiling. I'm going to run further and faster, and by God's help, we're going to do it together. Uh, the demographic of our church is odd. We've got a bunch of like 20 and 21-year-olds who are crying out to God and a bunch of 85 year olds who've been praying for revival for 70 years and it's so awesome to see these like two cultures collide because we got loud music uh, and we got bad preaching and we're meeting in a church that we're renting out and we've got people in the back plugging their ears people in the front just going after God uh, but at the end of the day it's awesome because what they see in us is part of the answer to their prayer and to their sowing and to their seed that they've invested into the ground for years and years and years for the scripture that says that unless the seed goes into the ground and first dies, it produces no good thing. And what we're seeing is mothers and fathers who have said, this is what we've been crying out for, a generation hungry and passionate for the things of God. Come on, our faith isn't in statistics. Come on, I've read every online article, I've seen every statistic, every demographic about why there's no hope for the under 30 crowd, but I'm telling you, if God is on the throne, there's still hope for young people. If God is on the throne, there's still hope, and there's still help for churches. Everywhere you go, every news media report there is, they're talking about the death of the church, the death of Christianity in America, the death of, of, of a religious persuasion amongst, amongst the millennials, but I'm telling you that God is doing something significant, and he's got more people than we think he's got. I just want to believe in him like he believes in me. I just want to love him like he loves me. I just want to have more faith in life than I do in death. I just want to have more faith in what the word says and less faith in what Google says. I just want to have more faith in this idea that God's not done with my generation. And so I cry out day and night for revival in my day and reformation in my lifetime because God's not done. He's not because he still draws near to people who draw near unto him, because God is no respecter of person, because on the day of Pentecost, it was on young and on old, on male and on female, on men servants and on female servants. It was on every socioeconomic class. It was on every generation. It was the coming together for the release of a sound that would unite people under the banner, which is Christ Jesus. I love it. And in the Old Testament at the Tower of Babel, man attempts to reach God, and there's confusion brought on the earth. But in the New Testament, God reaches men. They begin to speak in a tongue. All who are gathered hear the wonderful works of God declared in their own language. Peter preaches a message that he steals from the Old Testament. 3,000 are saved. The New Testament church is planted, and we're standing on the shoulders of those who have come before us. Yeah. Uh, Lawrence and Christine, I just, as I was praying, I felt like the Lord gave me a picture. Um, I was watching golf today. It was the only channel that wasn't in Spanish on Lighty's TV. I, I don't know what's going on, but, but I don't have the patience for golf to watch it or to play it. But as I was praying, the Lord uh, gave me a picture of like a golf ball on a tee and uh, somebody swinging back and getting ready to hit it full force. And, and uh, I think it's a brand of golf ball. It's a Titleist or Title or something like that. And uh, as, as the, the, the golf club was going backwards, getting ready to swing, it was like, it was like the Lord was saying that, that setbacks are setups for comebacks. Like this idea of there's more strength and more energy on the follow through uh, because of the drawback and, and that there was a shift coming in your title. And I don't know what that means. Um, but I just felt like he was saying, I'm getting ready to hit the titleist ball. I'm, I'm getting ready to hit that title off of the tee. It's going to launch you guys as a couple into some new things. But there was a shift upon the title of your guys' marriage, of your guys' ministry. So I just bless you guys with that and excited for some of what God is doing in your life. 
I'm excited for your youth ministry, your, your building, and what God is doing through. We sowed into that as a ministry this morning. We believe in you guys. Um, and, uh, and I just feel like even in the next six to nine months, I just, I, just, I just feel like all of the finances for that remodel are coming in. All of the finances for the addition are coming in. I actually feel like this school year for your Christian school is going to be a turnaround year for the school. And so I don't know if that's connected at all. But I'm just saying, like, there is... Um, God's given you a real grace, Sam, for evangelism, and he's even opening up doors, I feel like, into public schools and public institutions for you. Um, but this isn't the last time the youth ministry is going to double. As you grow, um, God is going to do more. The Lord spoke to me when my wife and I got pregnant unexpectedly. I mean, we know how it happened, but it was unexpected to us, you know what I mean? But I felt like the Lord spoke to me, and he said, resource always follows vision. You know how people always say, like, oh, man, we can't afford this baby, right, until you have it, and then you just figure out how to afford it every time. Right, every time. And I just feel like God said, you launch the vision, I'll fund it. You launch the vision, I'll resource it. And so I just feel like he's saying, uh, I feel like he wants to remind you that even the father spoke of Jesus before he ever begun his public ministry at the baptism of John the Baptist, where John the Baptist baptized, he says, well done, good and faithful. Or, or no, he says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. I just feel like the father is saying over you um, that, that even before um, you started to have favor in areas of ministry, he speaks over you, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That the pleasure and the favor of the Lord follows you. And when you follow God, what follows God follows you. And it's goodness and it's mercy. Like David says in Psalms 23, surely goodness and mercy will follow me the days of my life. Even when Moses asked to see the face of God, and God says, no man may see my face and live, but I'll hide you behind the cleft of the rock. And as I pass in front of you, you'll see what follows me. And the Bible says it's goodness and the goodness and the favor of God. It's unfair, but it follows you. It surrounds you. Uh, and I just feel like he's saying uh, uh, it, that, uh, that, that in due time, I'll promote you. In due time, I'll promote you. But there's just a real favor, a real, a real favor uh, on your life and a real grace that will continue to grow for evangelism. Uh, and so I'm just excited for you guys. We're praying for you. As, uh, as, as a youth and, and, and a young adult ministry. But Lord will also encourage you that uh, you are a father to people who are older than you. And even though that's kind of a weird mindset to think of, I just feel like he's saying uh, you're a better preacher than you think. You're a better father than you think. You're a better communicator than you think. You just are. Uh, and, and as you continue to grow and walk in the grace of the Lord, he's going to continue to like enlarge the territory of your influence in unfair ways. And it's not nepotism because the most important title you will ever have is not a son of Paul, it's a son of God. Right, and so. Oh, that's a good word. Awesome. Hey, John 4, starting in verse 1, I want to share with you a little bit uh, the story of the woman of the well um, because it's impactful for me. It's impactful uh, for, uh, uh, for my life. It's kind of become like a life message, a life sermon. Uh, all of you, I would imagine, if you spend any amount of time in church or any amount of the time in the gospels, you're familiar with the story of the woman at the well. I love the apostle John. Now, the Apostle John is a hero of mine. He's one of the only disciples who dies of, of, of natural causes of old age. Uh, it's not because the Roman government didn't try to kill him. Uh, in fact, before they uh, exiled him to an island to rot away, they tried to boil him in a vat of oil. He refused to die, so he preached to the Roman Colosseum who came to watch him burn, and they all got converted. Uh, the government gets scared, sends him to Patmos because they think he can't cause any trouble there, and has an open revelation of what heaven looks like. Right, and then writes to us the letter, the book of Revelation. And so I love the Apostle John. He's a man who can't die because he's already dead. Uh, he's an individual who lives with a radical passion uh, to see the things of God uh, uh, demonstrated uh, in a way that affects the cities of the earth. The Apostle John is probably the closest person to Jesus. He, he is one of the three, and he's one of the one. Uh, in fact, he writes about himself in the third person in the book of John as the disciple whom Jesus loves. Right, And it's like, you're talking about yourself, John, so it's kind of unfair. But anyways, you know. Uh, he, he is very confident about the relationship that he has with Christ, but, he, uh, but he's an amazing individual. And all throughout uh, church history, the Apostle John has a, a, a special place um, in, in history. Uh, John 4 uh, is recording this uh, interesting interaction that Jesus has with a Samaritan woman. And uh, I'll get to that in a minute, but I want to encourage you. Um, as I begin, I don't know how I got sidetracked, but I begin to tell you the story of, of how our ministry started. We met with three guys in a cafe. One of, one of these individuals is my wife. And we just said, man, if we pray and fast, if we pray and fast, God will do something in our generation. If we pray and fast, we pray and fast, we pray and fast. I remember the first Sunday that we doubled to eight people. Man, I was so excited. I was so encouraged. I thought, this is revival. We've made it. You know, we're doubling. This is New Testament growth. This is explosive. This is exponential. Bless God, you know. I was waiting for the invites to roll in, you know. Come on, we went from four to eight. But we just begin to pray. Just begin to intercede, believing 
that, that what was most important about our ministry wasn't the seating capacity, but the sending capacity. That God would give us people who are hungry to be laborers, thrust out, ekbalot out into the harvest field. It's interesting when Jesus encourages his disciples to lift up their eyes and see that the fields are ripe unto harvest. When he encourages them to have a view that you don't have to wait three, six, nine months until the harvest, but it's ready right now. When he encourages his disciples to be thrust out, that term he uses, thrust out, is the same term that's used when the Bible talks about casting out demons, almost, almost like the scripture would say that the same passion that Christ had to dispel darkness is the same passion he has to release light. That God is so interested in the harvest that, they're, that, 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 that people are more ready than we give them credit for. Do you know that the people at your workplace are more ready than you give them credit for? They just are. Well, I'm just waiting on the Lord. Come on, the Lord's waiting on you. He is, because on the cross, Christ said, it is finished, and what begun was an era of global harvest, that all who would call upon the name of the Lord would be saved, right? You are here during the best time on earth. You ever read scripture and get jealous of what people experienced, right? You ever read the Old Testament and go, man, what would it have been like to see God walk in front of us? But guys, I've got good news. We've got something better because the Holy Spirit takes residence in our lives because we become a temple of the Most High. Because even like Stephen preaching to the Sanhedrin prior to him being stoned, he said that God does no longer dwell in temples built by hands of men, but he dwells inside of us. We are living in the best time on earth. You are here on purpose, with purpose, to make a dent on the world around you. And I'm telling you, if you'll make time to create history with God. God will take time to make history with you. He just will if you'll just believe right that the people around you are more ready than you think they are. You know, in our generation, come on, we just want everything microwave. We want everything so quick. You know, and 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 and, and we're a microwave generation, but watch, God, he's a crock pot God. He takes time. Right? He takes time. Right, so the most important thing that you can develop in your life is a consistency that says, even when I don't see what I want to see right now, I believe in a God who is working in the places I can't see. Right, I believe in a God who is working behind the scenes all the time, every time, day and night. He doesn't take time off. He doesn't take three weeks in the summer to vacation. There's no night in heaven all the time. He's advocating on your behalf. So if you're believing God for some incredible things this evening, if you're believing for breakthrough, if you're believing for family reconciliation, if you're believing for financial restoration, you can take faith in the idea that God is more concerned about it than you are, and he is working on your behalf. Come on. He just is. All right, so we believe in a crockpot God. You know, you can put something in the microwave and take it out after 60 seconds, and it's edible. It is, right? <laughs> Come on, it might be dangerous long-term or even short-term, but it's edible. But you put something in a crockpot, you let it cook for a week. Come on, that sustains you a little bit. You go, man, this has been flavored by something. This has been seasoned by something. Man, God is interested in the seasoning and in the flavoring of your life. Now, we got enough people who live microwave Christianity and then have the audacity to get upset at God when he doesn't answer in their time frame. Come on, how many of you know that when God doesn't answer in your time frame, it's because his season oftentimes isn't your season. His ways and his plans often aren't your ways and your plans. In fact, the scripture says that a man makes plans, but watch, God directs his steps. Wow. And this is my idea, and this is what I want to do, and this is the time frame in which I want it to happen. Now, I remember graduating from Bible college thinking for sure I was going to get called into full-time ministry, just waiting for the, the phone to ring off the hook, like, like kind of on NFL draft day, waiting by the phone, you know, just hoping it's going to ring, and which church is going to want me, and, and it didn't happen like that at all. <laughs> Come on, I went into Babylon, I started working in politics, I had no opportunities, I just said, God, I just be here, and I just be faithful, and I'll just be salt and light where you've asked me to be salt and light, but if I were to be honest, I have no idea what you're doing, and God said, good. God said good, right? Because I'm more interested in your development than I am in your deliverance. I'm more interested in the seasoning of your life than the microwave answer that you think that you want. How many of you have ever prayed prayers and then been glad looking back on it that God didn't answer it the way that you thought? Come on, you've been in that relationship. Oh, Lord, please make her my wife. Come on. Six months later, you're glad she aged her wife. You know the only thing worse than being single is wishing you were single. You know what I mean? Man, God is just really interested in our development. It's just what I found. He just is. He's really interested in the seasoning of our lives. Because like the scripture says, we are epistles read by who? All men. I don't know about you, but when somebody reads the story of my life, 
Man, I want it to leak the goodness, the grace, the maturity of God doing something bigger than me inside of me. But that only happens if you refuse to buy in to kind of the commitment-phobic Christianity that's an epidemic in our generation. Man, we're so finicky as it pertains to the things of God. For real. I don't know about you, and, and, and I, I'm, I'm teaching a little bit out of where I've come from, but also a little bit out of where I, I'm, I'm at currently. You know that a message doesn't really have authenticity uh, when it comes from you. It has authenticity when it goes through you. you. You know what I mean? You ever hear somebody teach on something, you're like, man, they've gone through that. <laughs> come on, they know what it's like. They've been at death's door. They've had some experiences that they can teach from. You know the difference between teaching and imparting? You'll teach what you know, but you'll impart who you are. You just will. Right? That's why the apostle Paul tells Timothy, you have many teachers, but watch, few fathers. He said, Timothy, you better honor the fathers in your life. Why? Because you can teach what you know, but you'll impart who you are. Right? The more time that you spend with Jesus, the more time that you take to create an intimate relationship with Him, the more you look like Him, the more you smell like Him, the more you sound like Him. And so God has been working in my life kind of this idea of, Russell, stay consistent. Russell, stay on point. Russell, stay on target. Come on, even, e- e- even when you look at the monthly numbers and they're not where you want, Russell, stay on target. Refuse to be dissuaded because what I'm doing in you and through you is bigger than you, right? And so if your mind uh, uh, becomes so polluted by disappointment, by disillusionment, that you end up giving up early on the thing that I've asked you to steward, uh, then all you're doing is shortchanging the people that I've asked you to father. You know, we talk a lot about revival, not a whole lot about fathering. And when I think about revival, I always think about fathering because because unless you have the quick burn, marry the slow burn, you're going to have an inconsistent burn. What we've got to do is merge the passion that, that, that people have to see a move with God with, 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 with uh, uh, the consistency of fathering and mothering things beyond a weekend, beyond a month, beyond a retreat, beyond a conference to say, you know what? I signed up for life and I refuse to give up on the thing that God's doing. Come on, you got to develop kind of a biblical stubbornness in your life where you go, you know what, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere because the God who is working inside of me is bigger, better, and badder than the work of the world coming against me. So I'm going to stay right here. I just am. I'm just going to stay right here. We begin to pray in this cafe, and I said, God, if you just move. God, if you'll just show up, God, I, I, don't even, I, I don't even know what that will look like, but God, I'm going to stay here and pray and fast until you do something bigger than me that looks like you. I mean, within nine months, Doug could testify to this, but we had hundreds of young people. Uh, the church campus that they were on, Doug, I, I'm telling the truth here, they ran a funeral home, a mausoleum. They had dead people buried in the walls. It's the only place that they would stick, they, they would stick us after we grew out of the cafe. And so, like, I don't know if you've ever plotted out, like, a perfect ministry plan, but meeting in a funeral home with young people is not on it, right? <laughs> but we just pray, God, just give us a passion. God, we just want to see you. We just, want, we just want to see you for who you are. We just believe that you're better than we think and you're closer than we think, so we're going to hold on to that until we see you, not through the lens of religion and not through the lens of culture, but through the lens of Scripture. God, we just want to see you for who you are. About 12 months ago, Lord began to work on my heart and said, Russell, I'm asking you to go on a new adventure with me. And, and uh, what I found is that God often gets your um, agreement before he shows you the extent of the thing that he's asking you to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do you know that your understanding and your, um, your, uh, 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 your, your propensity to want a complete picture uh, is never a prerequisite for your obedience. It's just not. Yeah. It's just not. And so God, God began to speak to me. And, I, and the longer you walk with God, it's like the longer you know. Like he'll show up in the room and you won't even hear his voice, but you'll know his will because you're just around him. You know what it's like? Yeah. Like when you've been married for longer than six months, I just get around my wife and she doesn't have to tell me when she's upset. I just know, right, because I can feel it in the room. I just go, what did I do? What did somebody else do? Come on, something's wrong. Right? I can just sense it. And, and God, would, God would get in the room. God would get in my prayer closet. And I could just sense that God was saying, Russell, I'm asking you to go on a new adventure. I'm asking you to go on to a great adventure. And I said, all right, God, whatever it is, I'm down for adventure. That sounds fun. 
uh, and, and a month later, he said, I'm asking you to plant. And so we did. Uh, we sold everything we had. Literally, we moved in with my wife's parents. You know it had to be the Lord if you move in with your in-laws, and we did. Come on, we planted this church, and we just believed that either we were crazy or that God was good, right? And we're, we're, we'll roll the dice every time on that equation. And God just showed up. Uh, and people begin to just uh, uh, kind of bubble with excitement that, that maybe, just maybe, God wasn't done with the Northwest. And so uh, about a month ago, we had struck a deal to lease a building in downtown Snohomish, uh, which is the city in which we have planted. And, and Snohomish is like an antique city. Uh, it, it, it was one of the first pioneered cities in that region. It's filled with a lot of rural farmland. And it's got like a tiny downtown district with a bunch of antique shops. Uh, but we felt like the Lord wanted us to be in the heart of the city because we don't just want to disciple people. We want to disciple nations, right? We are after cities. We're after buildings. We're after structures. We're after people uh, because, because we, just, we, just don't, we just don't want to, in the way that we live, to dishonor the courage and the boldness that God's asked us to carry, right? And so we just believe that we got to live in a way that testifies to people who are watching us that if we can do it, God, that you can do it, right? And I think this is why God often uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Because when you see somebody foolish doing something awesome, you go, if he can do it, come on, I can do it. But if this dude can do it, I can do it. So we had struck a deal to lease a building, and, and about three weeks ago, the deal that we had worked on and worked on and worked on fell through, and we were devastated. We just began to cry out and say, God, we need a place to land. We need a place to stick people. Uh, we thought that you were calling us to the downtown district. Did we miss it? Did you miss What's going on? And so we were just beginning to pray, and I got a call from the church who was selling the building, and they said, Pastor, we're interested in helping your church get into our building, and we want you guys to buy it. And I said, awesome. Here's the problem. We have no money, right? We planted 10 months ago. We got a bunch of 21-year-olds and a bunch of 85-year-olds. The 21-year-olds don't have jobs. The 85-year-olds are on fixed income, right? We don't have money, right? But we got faith in a lot of it because what we lack in finances, we make up in faith. <laughs> And so I said, listen, man, I'm in it if God's in it, but I'm telling you our bank account ain't in it. So somebody's going to need to call Bank of America and let them know about what God's speaking to you. And he said, well, Pastor, how much had you agreed to lease the building for? And I said, well, we had agreed to lease it for $3,500 a month. And he said, stop. I'll sell you the building. We'll carry the note for $3,500 a month. Bam, we bought a building. They told us the history of the church. They said it was the first church ever planted in the city of Snohomish. It's 130 years old. The way that it started is 10 women begin to get a burden to pray that God would save the souls of the farmers who are around them. Out of that, God birthed a church. And 130 years later, because of the prayers of 10 women who walked in intimacy with God, a church filled with a bunch of broken young people are moving into a city to take some land. Guys, we are excited about what God is doing. Right, this brings me to John 4. I better start preaching. John 4, John 4. Okay, starting at verse 1, let me share quickly. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed, watch, needed to go through Samaria. Let me stop there for a minute. As, as, as believers, as Bible-believing believers, uh, by the way, as it pertains to politics, here's what I like to say to the reporters who call me. From my house to the crack house to the White House, Jesus is Lord. Right? So at the end of the day, our faith is not built in political answers. It's built in spiritual realities. Right? Even look at the disciples prior to Jesus ascending into heaven. He's saying, wait for the promise of the Father. And they go, awesome, is this when you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he says, no. <laughs> Right, because there's never a political answer to a spiritual problem. It, as believers, we believe every word of Scripture is inspired, not just the thoughts, not just the ideas. Right, so it's not just like, oh, the concept of Scripture is inspired. When biblical inspiration goes, here's the problem. You become a slave to whatever sounds good. Right, see, that's the danger of a generation that doesn't have a standard, is that we become slaves to whatever sounds good. Good. And so as believers, we believe every word of Scripture is inspired. And the Bible says here in verse 4, he needed to go through Samaria. And I fly out tomorrow. I'm doing a youth conference in Phoenix. And uh, oftentimes when I'm speaking at youth retreats, youth conferences, I always hit on this topic that there's a difference between what you need, watch, and what you want. I think oftentimes we use the word need to describe the idea want. <laughs> I need this. I need that. No, you want that. 
And at the end of the day, if you didn't have it, your life wouldn't end. And it's more of a want. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just doesn't mean that it's a need. But the Bible says in verse 4 of John 4 that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Now what we know about Samaria from first century historians is that it's a dry and deserted area filled with a bunch of people who were viewed as kind of the half-breeds by the Jewish people. In fact, Samaria was so despised and disgusted by the religious leaders that if they needed to get to a city on the other side of Samaria, they would walk around instead of walking through. They hated the people, they hated the city, and they didn't have compassion for what was going on. Yet Jesus, the best shepherd and the best rabbi and the best teacher and the best leader in verse 4 says, I need to go through those places. You know, in your life and in my life, Jesus needs to go through the places that we don't want to invite him into. He just does. He needs to go through the dry places because it's easy to give God what you want. That's not worship. Worship is giving God what you don't, right? Worship is offering unto God the things that you have held so near and dear to your heart. God, I'll give you this, but I won't give you that. God, I'll give you my pain, but I won't give you my future. God, I'll give you my sin, but I won't give you my finances. Isn't it interesting how easy we trust God with our sin and and, 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 and how we operate in such distrust as it, as it, as it, uh, involves our finances, right? We so begrudgingly give our finances, but we so easily give our sins. God, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. God, help me out. God, if you just bail me out, man, I'll be good for next week. God, if you just get me through this test, if you just get me out of this ticket, if you just help me get through this meeting, God, if you just be there for me in this one moment or this one time, I promise I'll be good. I promise I'll never make another mistake. Right? Don't buy into bailout Christianity. And Jesus will bail you out because he's so good, but what he's really looking for is sons and daughters who will walk in the garden with him. Remember, it begun in a garden, but it's going to end in a garden too. He's looking to restore garden relationship with sons and daughters who just walk with him. I love that Jesus always irritates the religious leaders by doing the things that they wouldn't do in a way that would bring heaven to earth. The religious leaders wanted to be delivered from the Roman government, but instead Jesus came to deliver them from their sin. Do you know that God is more concerned with your holiness than he is with your happiness? He just is. doesn't mean God's not concerned with your happiness. He just knows that happiness comes from a life that imitates the Father above. Jesus is always doing the things that the religious leaders won't. He's always doing the thing that offends not just the religious leader, but that religious spirit. He needed to go through Samaria. So, Samaria. So he came to the city of Samaria which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat by the well. It was about the sixth hour or about 12 p.m. Now a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away to buy lunch. The woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans? Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God... And who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The story goes on. The woman says to Jesus, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, go get your husband. The woman responds, I don't have a husband. Jesus says, you're correct because you've had five and the one you are with now is not your husband. You know, people think the Bible is an old book, but it still speaks to the contemporary issues of today. Come on, does it sound like anybody you know? It sound like a broken city or a broken family that you've ever met? Wow, the Bible's an old book, man. Pastor, I don't really know if we can trust it. I don't really know if it can still speak to the greatest issues and, 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 and the greatest thoughts of the human heart today. Or, or I don't know if it can still heal the human condition. Guys, it's an old book, but it's filled with good truth. It just is. It's an old book, but it still speaks to the issues that plague the human condition and plague the human heart. The woman responds to Jesus, says, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. You Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know, but we worship what we know, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. Verse 25, the woman says to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. Uh, I want to go quickly. I accidentally kicked off my clock here. uh, And so when I'm done, you just just raise a white flag and let me know. 
uh, I want to give you uh, four things that... Um, uh, four things that help block a move of God. Four things that help block a move of God from John 4. Uh, here's um, what I believe about the moving of the Spirit of God. You can't stop it, but you can miss it. Yeah. You, can, you, you can't stop it, but you can miss it. Uh, God is interested in releasing a river through dry places, just like Vegas, through dry places, just like Seattle, through dry places like, like from the West Coast uh, to the East Coast. God is interested in releasing His Spirit without measure. Do you know that to the church without mixture, God will release His Spirit without measure? He just will. Right To the men and to the women without mixture, God will release His Spirit without measure. This idea that if we will remain wholly committed to Him, that we can not only be a part of what God is doing, but we can be stewards of the river of God that doesn't just flow around us, but flows from us. How do we know that? John 7, Jesus stood up on the last day of the great feast and said, Out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Four things that help block a move of God. Number one, John 4, verse 7, the woman says to Jesus, Verse 9, the woman says to Jesus, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritan. First thing that will help block a move of God in your life is an identity crisis. An identity crisis. Listen, when you don't know who you are, it's always a reflection of a misunderstanding of who God is. How do we know that? Because you were made in His image. So the more you know about God, the more you know about you. Right? So you never learn more about you by looking inside. Right? If I just look inside and find that inner light. Come on, if I can just buy into all this new age philosophy, I can find out who I truly am. I just got to go find myself. I love when people leave church and use that as an excuse. I just got to go find myself. What do you mean? If you're lost, the place you should be is in church. Yeah. Well, I just got to go find myself. Listen, the more you know about God, the more that you know about you. And so as you see him for who he really is, you can see you for who you really are as well. You know what the world tries to do is tries to throw dirt on your identity. What it tries to get you to be is a hearer of the word but not a doer. So you look in the mirror and forget your image and have to return. And yet God all the time is trying to get you to see him for who he actually is so that you can know on a molecular level who you actually are as well. When you suffer from a low self-esteem, it's because you suffer from a low view of God. It just is. And when you have a revelation about the goodness and the kindness and the mercy of a God who is better than you think and closer than you think, it realigns your identity to match what he's saying. It just does. And so what we're interested in is building a community of people who know who they are because they know whose they are, right? Because I know who I belong to and because I confess what the scripture says about who I am, I walk in a level of confidence, not arrogance, but confidence. I know that I can boldly approach the throne of grace in my time of need because Jesus the advocate is making intercession on my behalf. I know that if I search after his heart, I'll get whatever is in his hand. I just know that if I seek the gift, I'll get the gift. If I just know who he is, I can know who I am as well. Right, that's why the Apostle Paul, when he encourages the church in Thessalonica, says that upon his appearing, that all who see him will be like him. That we will be transformed into his likeness, watch, and into his image. And so when we show the world who God actually is, it helps people discover who they actually are as well. And the world is looking to tell you who you are. They just are. The culture is looking to have a game plan for your life. They just are. And when you can get free from the opinions of people, when you can get free from the fear of man, when you can get free from the fear of failure or the fear of success and truly live as a son or as a daughter who, who, who has been impacted by a love relationship with Jesus, I'm telling you, those type of people walk different. You know that you walk different when you know who your father is? You do. You don't walk as an orphan. You don't walk as one who's returned to bondage. You walk as a son or as a daughter, not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done. You just do. Guys, it's not arrogant to believe what the Bible says about you. It's a mandate from God. Right? It's not arrogant to believe that, man, God is going to use me to make a dent on history. Just read the pages of Scripture and have your hope and faith stirred that God wants you to expand the boundaries of your thinking and of your dreaming. What is our prayer? That God would do exceedingly above more than we could ask or think. So what does that tell us? Let's dream big. Let's ask big. Let's think big because God is big enough and, 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 and better enough to do, to do bigger than we've asked or thought. And so we ask big, we dream big, we believe big, we intercede big because we know God is saying, I'm going to do even better than you've asked. 
Right? So I would encourage you that when you're asking for restoration, don't just ask to get back what you've lost. Ask for twofold or threefold and watch what God does. Right? When you're asking for reconciliation, don't just ask, ask that somebody would be treating you nice. Don't just ask that your family could come together once a year and celebrate Thanksgiving without a food fight. Right? Yeah. Begin to ask God. Begin to proclaim that he's doing a better thing. He's doing a new thing. That he's not done with your family. He's not done with your line. He's not done with your finances. And then just sit back and watch him work because he will. Because he does better than we could ask or think. This woman says to Jesus, how is it that you, a Jew, ask of me, a Samaritan, to give you a drink? And how does Jesus respond? If you only knew. See, I think oftentimes the advocate in heaven is, 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 is proclaiming over us, man, if you only knew, you'd ask a little bigger. If you only knew, you'd believe a little better. Man, if you only knew, you'd take a step. If you only knew what I was capable of doing. Man, you'd live a little bit more on the edge. You know, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much room. You just are. Come on, I want to get to heaven and have more of an accomplishment than just a nine to five, and more, more than just a perfect church attendance. I want to make a dent on the world. And listen, even if I don't always get it right, come on, even if I make a few mistakes along the way, I serve a God who is big enough to honor the position of my heart. And so God created me a clean and a pure heart so that when I'm running and searching after you, even if I don't always get it right, I refuse to run with anything but a burning white hot passion. This woman says to Jesus, how is it that you ask a drink of me if you only knew? John 4 verse 11, the woman says to Jesus, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get the living water? The first thing that will block a move of God in your life is an identity crisis. But the second thing that will block a move of God in your life is religion and tradition. Now, not all religion and tradition is old, uh, is bad. But when you build an altar to what God did in the past, then you, have, then you have helped block up what God wants to do in the present and in the future. Listen, it doesn't mean that we can't honor what's come before us, but, but, but the the reality is that what has come before us serves as a testimony to propel us into the new thing that God wants to do in this season. You know, I think oftentimes we get mad at God because we pray for things and then he answers in a way that looks different than what we've previously experienced. And we end up cursing the thing that God's trying to bless. Oh God, I want revival, but I don't want anybody who looks different than me to sit next to me at church. Oh God, I want you to save souls as long as you keep those ladies out of the church who've been selling their bodies on the street. God, I want you to do something significant as long as the worship band doesn't change their style. Oh God, I want you to do something in my life as long as it doesn't violate my comfort zone. Listen, in life you have a choice. You can be comfortable or you can be anointed, I would encourage you to be anointed. Right? I would encourage you to be an individual who says, listen, man, I appreciate the things that have happened in the past, but it was the, it was the cry of the prophet Habakkuk who said, oh God, revive your work in my day. Oh God, do it again in my day. And don't just do it like you did it before, but do it uh, uh, in, in abundance. Do it above and beyond the things that we've experienced in the past. All over scripture is this theme that what God would do in the latter would be greater than what God has done in the former. That the things that God desires to do, the best days of our life are, for, are, are, are in front of us. Listen, you got to refuse to drown in a bathtub of criticism when you are swimming in an ocean of potential. You have to refuse to get so focused on the review mirror that you miss out on the windshield of faith. You have to refuse to live for compliments because then you'll die by criticism. You have to be an individual who says, God, I, 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 it's not that I despise everything that's happened in the past, um, but we're not going back to what you did in the past because I want something new for my, for, for my church, for my life, for my family, and for my generation. Come on, when I, when I asked God to give me the faith to go on an adventure, I didn't know that it would look like losing my salary, losing my health insurance, and planting a church in a barn where we had owls and bats flying in and out of the service. Right? But I said, God, if this is the adventure that you're on, even if it takes me through the valley of the shadow, as long as you're there, I know that you'll still make a table for me. Right, as long as you're there, that's the place that I want to be. Right, it's like the three Hebrew boys who are about to get thrown into Nebuchadnezzar's fire. They're like, listen, God's going to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow to you. God, wherever you're at, that's where I want to be. Whether it's on the edge of the furnace, come on, whether it's in the promised land, whether it's in the wilderness looking for the promised land. God, whatever it is, maybe it's like Acts 16, you're Paul and Silas caught in the Philippian jail. And you begin to sing worship songs at midnight, and all of a sudden the jail doors fling open. And yet, where do Paul and Silas go? Nowhere. And when the Philippian jailer wants to kill himself, Paul cries out, Don't worry, we are all still here because their cry wasn't for deliverance, it was for development. 
And what was birthed in the city of Philippi? An entire family that got born again and was baptized, kind of like what we saw tonight, who decided to plant a church in a lady's house named Lydia. And God transformed a city because Paul and Silas had a heart to say, God, we don't just want to get out. We want you to do something right here. I think so many times we miss out on what God's trying to do because he answers our prayers in a way that offends the image that we built in our own mind. Remember, one of the Ten Commandments is thou shall not build any type of image, graven image of who God is. But in our minds often, come on, we build altars and idols to the way that we think God works. And then when he does it in a different way, we have the audacity to get offended. And God just says, trust me, walk with me, work with me. When you live in yesterday's move of God, no matter how great it was, you've just stopped up a well of revival in your life. Methods change, but the message stays the same. Remember the words of the Apostle Paul, forgetting those things which are behind, I press ahead for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Man, I've got, I've got a word of wisdom to some folks in here tonight who are north of 50 years old. And I, I want to tell you this. That the only way that you know that you're old is when your memories become more powerful than your dreams. And it don't matter if you're 85 or 8.5. I would encourage you to have dreams that are bigger than your memories. And to say, God, I so appreciate what I've walked through. But God, if I don't see something for the here and now, then you can just go ahead and take me home. God, I want my dream to consume me and my memory to compel me. But I refuse to live in what you did yesterday, yesteryear. Come on, the number one thing I think that will block a move of God, identity crisis. Number two, religion and tradition. Number three is this, sin. Believe it or not, sin. John 4, 17. The woman answered and said to him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said you have no husband. You've had five. The one you're with now, you're just hooking up with. The danger of sin is found in its distortion of the image of God that Christ desires to burn in your heart. You know what I love about Jesus? He's probably the only male in the city of Samaria that approaches this woman not wanting the one thing that she sold in the past. And he says to her, listen, I just want you to go call your husband because I'm not just interested in changing you. I'm interested in changing your whole city. Do you know that often God will ask you for things that you don't have to reveal to you what you really need? And he asks this woman, go call your husband. I don't have one. You've well said you don't have one because you've had five and those haven't worked. And you've gone from man to man looking to fill the identity hole in your heart. And none of it has worked until now. And what I offer you is greater than you could ever comprehend. And no, you don't deserve it. But that's the point of the gospel. What I deserve, you get. And what you deserve, you don't get. That was the transaction of the cross. Christ bore your sin. He became your transgression so that you could become the righteousness of God. Come on, you know the cross, that, that was like huge for the faith, you know? Like pretty transitional for the faith. Right? Because he paid a debt he didn't owe. Why? Because you owed a debt you couldn't pay. And Jesus said, you know what? I'll become their debt. <laughs> and you know what's so amazing about the love of God? is that he loved the disciples who followed Jesus with the same intensity in which he loved the people who killed Jesus. Why? So that the message of hope could never be distorted by the message of how hard you try or how hard you work. Come on, the biggest demon that I think in the church we fall susceptible to is the demon of try harder. Oh, if you just try hard, come on, if you just work a little longer. Come on, if you just put in a few extra, if you just try a little harder, you could get breakthrough. You know, God, and Pastor Samuel said it, uh, said it tonight, but what God can do in a moment, come on, is better than what we could do in a lifetime. It just is. It just is. And if you believe that one moment with God can change everything about you, I'll tell you what, you'll do anything to get that moment. You will. You'll do anything to have that intimacy or that encounter with him. But Jesus, uh, like a delicate heart surgeon, begins to work on the issue of sin in her life. You know, I, I think many of the ways that we approach sin is like a chainsaw cutting down a tree. And yet the way that Jesus approaches sin, except as it pertains to religious leaders, is like a delicate heart surgeon who says, I don't want, to, I don't want the process of restoration or reconciliation to kill you because then you miss the point. Right? I'm not looking to damage you because you're not damaged goods. I'm not looking to hurt you because the world's already done that. I'm not looking to condemn you because you've already heard that the rest of your, you've already heard that for the past 10 years of your life. Right? And some of you, because of the way that you were raised or because of the way that you've lived, you've already heard that you're going to be a failure. You've already heard that the divorce is going to define you. You've already heard that you're going to carry that abuse like a scarlet letter the rest of your life. You've already heard that you're always going to be like your mom or you're always going to be like your dad. And, and from your family, that might not be a compliment. But God 
God looks at Jesus, looks at this woman, and he says, there's a sin issue that I love you enough to address because until I address that, you can't see me for who I really am. See, sin distorts our ability to see God for who he actually is. It gets us to focus inward. It gets us to self-condemn and to self-shame, to get caught in a cycle of sin where there's no hope and when there's no help. And yet the convictor of sin, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the helper works inside of us to continually, daily transform us, not into our our image, but into God's. You know the goal, I think, of Christian maturity and development is to every day look a little less like you and a little more like him. I'm so glad that God deals delicately with me and my sin. I just am. I really am. I really am. Right? Because oftentimes I'm my own harshest critic, and for many of you, you are as well. And yet God is never the voice of criticism. He's never the voice of hurt. He's never the voice of pain. For it is the kindness of God that leads men unto repentance. The third thing that will block a move of God in your life is sin. Let me end with this. Number four, John 4 verse 20 is the fight over worship. John 4 verse 20 is the fight over worship. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the right place to worship. And Jesus responds, there is coming a day where you will neither worship in Samaria or in this mountain but, or, or in Jerusalem. But true worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth. I think there are four primary things that help block a move of God in our life. The first is an identity crisis. right? The second is religion and tradition. The third is sin. But the fourth is a fight over worship. I'm not talking about a fight over I'm not talking about a fight over for what year, what genre, or what generation of songs that you like. I'm talking about the fight that rages on inside of us for the affection and the attention of our heart. Jesus tells this woman, worship is not about where you stand. It's not about where you look. It's not about this mountain or this geographic location. It's about understanding that the Father desires not just to visit you, but to inhabit you. Listen, we're not praying for a visitation. We want an inhabitation. Uh, the church for too long has been satisfied with the visitation of God. We just need a visit. No, I need him to move in. I need him to take residence in my city. I need more than just a fly-by-night revival meeting. I need more than just a good series of church plans. I, I, I need an inhabitation of the goodness of God to overtake my life, to overtake my city. And Jesus tells this woman, he says, man, until you can get this worship thing right, then you can't worship me in the way that I like, which is in spirit and in truth. And finally, this woman says to Jesus, she gets to the pinnacle where Jesus was leading her all along. And he says, she says to him, she says, one day I know the Messiah will come. And Jesus responds to her, I who speak to you am he. I love this. (laughs) I love this because this was the point of the initial conversation that Jesus had with a woman while his disciples were distracted with what they were going to eat for lunch. (laughs) They don't want to go to Samaria. They go into the city. Jesus goes to the places nobody else will to meet the people that nobody else wants, to touch the areas of the heart that we all try to hide. Why? Because what waited on the other side of this woman was a city that needed salvation. In fact, Jesus stayed in this city and ministered to these people and brought salvation to the Samaritans, even though salvation wasn't of the Samaritans. It was of the Jews because the Jews know what they worship. But it didn't stop Jesus from being a messenger of hope and a messenger of reconciliation, right? If you want to be a bridge of hope to the world, you got to be okay with being walked on every once in a while, right? you got to be okay with being misused and mistreated every once in a while because at the end of the day, it's not about you getting yours. It's not about you being right all the time. It's not about getting what's due to your name. It's about being an individual who refuses to be deterred, refuse to be shaken by the various trials. Like James 1 and 1 Peter, 1 sa- 1 Peter chapter 1 says this idea that rejoice in all various trials because it produces patience in your life. And when patience has had its perfect work, it perfects you and it completes you. And so I'm telling you what's being developed in the New Testament narrative from the book of Matthew all the way through the book of Revelation is getting our eyes off of ourselves and onto him because when we see him, we will be like him. So maybe you're here this evening. I know the worship team is coming up to close tonight. Maybe you're here tonight. And you say, Pastor, man, I feel like, I feel like I'm in that place. I feel like I've allowed right, some disappointment in my heart to take root. I, I feel like I've allowed uh, my persuasion or my focus to be shifted a little bit. I feel like there's been some injuries in my heart, some things that I've taken personally. I feel like there have been some various trials that instead of me being consistent in, I've cried out to God to deliver me from, and I think he might want to develop me in them. Right, then tonight I'd love to add my faith to yours, to pray for you, to believe for breakthrough in your heart and breakthrough in your mind because I believe that God is interested in accepting you just as you are, but he loves you way too much to leave you the same. Man, God loves you way too much to leave you the same. He loves you way too much to leave you unregenerated in your mind. He loves you way too much to leave you lost in, in, in self-pity. He, he loves you way too much to leave you in the middle of an identity crisis.
And in fact, I think he wants you to not only be a part of the river, he wants you to be one who releases the river in your workplace, in your family, come on, in your church, in your community, in your small group, in the place that you call home, in the place that you hate showing up for work at, with that boss that just irritates you, come on, with that person in your family who you just don't get along with. I just think God wants you to be a messenger of something different than the, than the normal messages that come from our culture. You know why I think the world doesn't want what the church has? Not because the church is weird, but because oftentimes the church just has a crappier version of what the world already has. Not this church, but I'm talking big C. I'm, I'm talking about this idea. Come on, help me. Come on, we got hope. I don't have time to be a victim. Neither do you. God's in a good mood. So am I. Come on, God is on the move. The gates of hell are not going to prevail. It's a good time to be at ICLV. It is. Because the gates of hell won't prevail against this place. They're on the move. Come on, there's more campuses in this future. Come on, there are more things that God has done. I'm just telling you. Come on, the flags that are represented up here, what that tells me is you got dreamers. You got visionaries. You got people whose windshield is bigger than their rearview mirror. You got people who are looking ahead, believing for God's best. And today, if you're feeling hopeless, if you're feeling lost, if you're feeling dismayed, if you're feeling like, man, I, I think maybe God's forgotten about some living water, then let me pray for you tonight. Come on, let's believe for breakthrough. Come on, let's believe for some good things. Let's believe for a river of living water. Let me tell you, church, if you only knew what was being offered, if you only knew. Come on, let's stand as we close all across this room. Father, we thank you for all those gathered under the sound of my voice at this campus, at the online campus. Father, I pray that something would be deposited in this local church this evening. Father, we thank you for Pastor Paul, Pastor Denise, for those who've laid their lives down to fuel and to fund the vision of what God is doing in this city. Father, we call Las Vegas to come back home. Father, we call prodigals to come back home. Father, we say salvation springs up from the ground. Father, we say that the heavens were open and they haven't closed. Father, we thank you that the best days are still ahead. The best funds are still ahead. Come on, the best altar calls are still ahead. The best baptisms are still ahead. Come on, the best schools are still ahead. God, we just thank you that the best days are still ahead. Come on, if you're here tonight, you know the Spirit of God is tugging on your heart. Maybe it's something I mentioned. Maybe it's something I'm not. But if you're here tonight, you want prayer. I'd love to partner with you in faith and believe for God's best in your life. Pastor Doug, why don't you just close